everyone. I'm Linda Nickel, and welcome to the Happiness Hour. Every Wednesday, photographers from all over the country join me here to connect, inspire, and create. And with the help of talented photographers who share their images, some of their favorite photography tips and techniques, and they inspire us all to improve our own photography skills. The schedule for upcoming presentations is on my website at lindanickel.com. And if you missed some of the previous sessions, you'll find them linked to the Happiness Hour YouTube channel. My guest tonight is Michigan-based photographer, Beth Thielo. Beth's favorite subjects are abstracts, architecture, flora and fauna, and ICM. And in tonight's presentation, experience photography freedom with intentional camera movement. ICM can add movement, depth, and texture to our work while inviting us to see the photographic potential in just about anything. Beth is going to help you get started with ICM by sharing some technical and artistic tips. And if you're already doing ICM, maybe she'll introduce you to something different. Welcome to the Happiness Hour, Beth. I'm so delighted to have you. I am so delighted to be here. Thank you so much, Linda. I am so grateful you invited me and um, and welcome to everyone. I am super glad that you're here. I know some of your names and faces because of Instagram. And um, I think some of us might've met it out of Chicago uh, types of events and whatnot. So it's just delightful to be here. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and, um, and let's get the party started. <laughs> um, I would love to have everyone share in the chat, if you would, what is your experience with ICM? And if you want to shortcut it by just putting the number, you can consider it on a spectrum of one, you love it, and it's something that you uh, do regularly, all the way to five, what the heck is ICM? I'm just here to get my happiness on. Um, so where do you fall on that spectrum? I am curious to know. Um, where we're at. So I see a number of dabbling. Um, Sherry, I am so glad. I hope you leave happy. <laughs> I see here a five. I see four. So I haven't tried it yet. Excellent. Pamela is a regular. Ariel is a regular. Um, let's see. Two, da, 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 da. I'm a solid one. Yay, Robert. Okay. Lots of twos. I completely love it. I feel like a child whenever I do it. I love that. Yeah. Then you'll identify with the way I end the presentation <laughs> a little bit. Um, Elizabeth or Liz says she only does it on her iPhone. And I will touch a little bit on iPhone, using your um, phone for ICM. Yeah. Um, Michelle is a one, 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 uh, you know, exclamation points. Uh, great. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. And, and I know Joanna. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Linda. No, I was going to say we've got Kathy Chassie in there that's frustrated with the number six. So you got to help her out. So. Number six, I started to put something in there that was like, yeah, it's upsetting to me, <laughs> you know, or it's frustrating, or it's confusing. Um, and so I hope that, you know, you, especially, you know, Kathy, if you're able to leave this and feeling like a little bit of inspired um, to just give it a try, then that'll be a, a huge win for me. Um, Ariel says, what is a seven? <laughs> and so maybe that's like off the charts, like, Really, I just want to like throw my camera against the the wall. So um, I love that we have this uh, this really wonderful spectrum here, and um, and I'm hoping that you know, as Linda mentioned, she saw me in the out of Chicago. We had seven minutes. I think I took eight because um, he doesn't quite cut you off, but. Um, it was still a lot. And even as I was preparing this, I thought, oh my gosh, am I going to be able to cram it all in? Um, so this is a deeper dive than that seven minutes at Out of Chicago allowed me. And there's still a lot to unpack. And so um, I'm just glad you're here for the journey. I've had some caffeine, so I'm hoping I can uh, squeeze it all in. So um, so let's get let's get going now that we know a little bit about who's in the room. 
Um, I started my ICM journey back in 20, spring of 2021, and it was a friend of mine named Jolie who lives in Tacoma. She had um, posted an image that she created in her camera club, um, and it was, uh, I believe it was a grove of aspens, and, you know, she had this beautiful blur in ICM, and I'm like, wow, that is so cool. How did you do that? And she said, oh, there's this technique called ICM, intentional camera movement, and so I went and did some research and watched some videos and started playing around with it. And by the time I went to out of Chicago, I went to the out of Chicago Botanic um, in uh, the fall of um, 21. And I was doing uh, participating in the image reviews that the instructors do in the evenings. And I was sitting down with one of the you know, the more popular instructors and we were going through my images and and they were really, you know, enjoying what they were seeing. And I get to one that's ICM and they were like, you know, this just doesn't, the, these kinds of things just don't do much for me. And, and part of it is like, why do this in camera and basically lose control, like not have any control? So this person was really... Um, about kind of controlling the image like and and perceiving ICM is like you're just losing control. Um, why not get it into Photoshop and manipulate it? And you know, I hadn't even thought of that, to be honest. Um, so when they said that, it kind of took me back a little bit and I had to think, well, yeah, why do we do that? you know, but the more I do it, the more I see how much um, creativity, artistic freedom, um, the, the authenticity that happens with um, ICM. Yeah, you, you know, like if anybody is a lens baby user, you know, you can go into Photoshop, you can add a Gaussian blur to um, one of your images, but it's not the same as if you're creating it with that lens in the field and um, and and envisioning it with that from the, the start. So, I think especially as things migrate towards so much AI that we're like, what's real, what's not, what's been manipulated, whenever we can embrace a technique that gives us a chance to be authentically artistic um, in this way, then it's worth, uh, it's worth doing. So why do this in camera and not have any control? because it's fun, but also because it's authentic and it's real and it's a little unpredictable and it's there's a little bit of risk and edge to it that, um, at least for me, is very energizing. And, and I hope that you come away from this thinking, yeah, this could really energize my photography. And um, yeah, if, if nothing else, if that's what happens, then I'm happy. I wanted to also share just, you know, the, the other thing is as we are looking at something like ICM or any of these photographic techniques that take us outside of the traditional um, framework that we're used to, we have to kind of think of it on a different plane. And I don't know if anybody's familiar with Ken Wilber. Um, I'm not even sure how to describe him, except he does a lot of sort of um, psycho-spiritual philosophy. And just, can't, just got this book yesterday, opened it up, and I was like, hmm, I wonder if there's anything on January 17th yesterday. And it happened, yes, and there was an entry, and um, he's writing about art. And this particular quote stood out to me, where he says, the purpose of truly transcendent art is to express something you are not yet, but that you can become. And something about that just really spoke to me when it comes to ICM and how we see and I'm just going to read just a quick little part of this. He says, um, all of us possess the, the eye of flesh, the eye of mind, and the eye of spirit. We can classify art in terms of which eye it mostly relies on. Realism and naturalism, for instance, rely mostly on the eye of flesh. Abstract, conceptual, and surreal. Sur, sur, I should have tried this before. Sur, um, Surrealistic art. <laughs> um, surrealistic? Hmm. Uh, rely mostly on the eye of mind. And a certain great works of spiritual art, Tibetan thinkers, um, like mandalas, for example, rely on the eye of contemplation, the eye of spirit. Each of these eyes sees a different world, the world of material objects, of mental ideas, of spiritual realities. And each eye can paint what it sees. The higher the eye, the deeper the art. 
And I feel like things like ICM call us to have that higher eye, <laughs> to have the eye of the spirit as opposed to the eye of the eye of the concrete um, and the tangible. So it's it's really inspiring us to kind of stretch uh, what our vision is. It also gets us out of this. <laughs> How many of us have been at workshops or a conference when you you have a group of photographers and everybody's looking at the same thing, all pointing their cameras in the same direction, even probably having the same lens on. And you know that they're probably often all getting the same shot. And there's a certain um, comfort and wisdom and, and learning that happens when we are getting the shot. But what ICM does is it, 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 it's, a, it's a yes and, yes, get this shot, be in this place. And once you do that, go ahead and and break it open and try different things and guaranteed you will come away with something that no one else has. And that's one of those things that I think is so wonderful about this. So I'm gonna break this up a little bit by going through each part of ICM, starting with intentional. And what does it mean to be intentional with our photography? And I'll start out with what it's not. But before I do that, I do want to point out, you'll see, and I don't know, can you see my cursor arrow, Linda? I can, yes. Okay. So I'm hovering here over this arrow. All of these images I share are mine. Um, and when I have had the information, I've included the metadata. Because one of the things that you'll notice when you join different ICM groups is that often they're very um, transparent and sharing. Here were my camera settings. Here's the motion I used. Here was the subject or the object of the, of the picture. And that's what part of what helps us to learn. So whenever possible, I've included that information and you'll always see it probably in the, the bottom near the image. So what is it not? It's not about blurry or out of focus pictures. <laughs> It's not just, oops, I accidentally moved the camera. That's where the intentional piece comes in. So it's not about blur or out of focus. It's not documentary. So you're not, you know, taking a literal shot of something and it's not meant to be purely representative of a particular scene. It's not rule bound. And I put... It, I'll talk about rules in just a minute because I think that this is one thing I've had a little bit of, um, I've been part of discussions where we've talked about, are there rules to ICM? Because some folks will say there are no rules. And I kind of push back a little and I'm like, well, there's, there's some rules and, and maybe we don't call them rules, but we call them something else. But generally we're letting go of a lot of the conventions I guess, um, of what photography has, teaches us about what we should be doing as photographers. And it's not the same as long exposure. And probably most of you know, the long exposure is most of the time you have a tripod. Um, the goal is to keep the camera still while the shutter is open for a longer period of time. So the thing that is in common is the shutter is open for a longer period of time. But obviously with intentional camera movement, we are moving the camera during that exposure. Um, so those two things are not the same. So when you take a long exposure, it is not the same as an um, ICM. What it is, is it's intentional. It is um, something that you are thinking about, that you're moving in a particular way, hoping for a particular result. Um, it's almost always abstract. Even this, like you probably can tell this is a calla lily but it's presented in this abstract way. You get more of the impression of the calla lily than a literal interpretation of it. And like I said, it's unique. Um, I couldn't even reproduce this image if I wanted to. And that's one of the things that can be frustrating about ICM is um, you'll, you'll do something and you're like, oh, okay, that was kind of cool. I'll try to do it again. And you try again and you can't do it. And that's one of those things you have to learn how to just flow with and release. And I'll talk and show you an example a little bit later about how paying attention to what is happening as you're taking those photos while you're in the field can help you get better at being able to kind of at least replicate certain movements to fine tune your results. And then why it's cool is because you have so much freedom. 
Um, you, you can move in any way you want. Um, you can mess with your settings. You know, it's, it's kind of a, it is a little bit anything goes. And that said, um, when it comes to rules, I think of it as more guidelines. Like as I'm sharing things with you, I'm going to share both technical and artistic suggestions or guidelines, um, things that will hopefully help you to create aesthetically pleasing images or adhere to certain artistic principles that um, people identify with good art, I guess, right? And so it's not so much rules, but we are still looking for the basics. We are still looking at the light. What kind of light do I have? Is there contrast in this scene and how can I take advantage of it? What's the form? What's the shape? Um, is my image balanced, you know, compositionally? What's the color like? You know, is it is it um, pleasing? Is it are the tones correct and all of that? Is it does it have some sort of discernible mood or story or vision behind it? And so the image, even though it's this abstract and not literal, it still needs something that holds your attention and makes the viewer curious or evokes an emotion or and or taps into something in your imagination. So those are all things to, you know, to continue to keep in mind. And of course, when you're editing them, you're still looking for, are there hot spots? Are there distractions? Do I check, you know, do uh, one of my mentors said, you know, border patrol. So are you checking all of the edges and making sure is everything that's in the frame necessary? Um, so you're still looking at all of those things. Um, and that's where, you know, rules or conventions might be, um, still come in handy. And as you're having, you know, entering into this ICM journey, and it's important to have a particular mindset, which you've probably already picked up on to embrace uncertainty and especially to embrace the non-replicable, <laughs> um, nature of ICM. That's just the kind of the way it is. Um, as you practice it, you'll start to learn and, and, and know, you know, correlation of when I do this, this happens. Um, but even then, it's still going to be a lot of um, experimentation and a lot of uncertainty. The mindset of always asking, what if? And that can go from, what if I move my camera this way? What if I... Um, crank up the um, the shutter speed as fast as I can, but still try to move. Like I've gotten as fast as one over 250 and made an ICM because I started the movement before I pressed the shutter. And so it captured just a little bit. So that's that comes from what if, not assuming, oh, you can't do ICM above one over 10, you know, or something like that. Um, and then what if I photograph something unusual. So you're looking at this image over here on the right. Um, it's a composite image that I um, put together in Photoshop. There's a traditional still of a leek plant. So you can see the, the cross section of those leaves. And then over that, where you see all the waves and swirls, that is construction paper that I cut up in strips and then put on a quill and then I and I made different sizes and they're in like blues and greens and whatnot. I put those on a light pad and then I did ICM with it and then put them together. And I don't even know what this evokes, except it's sort of, for me, it's, there's just something compelling about it. And, um, and so that's the what if. What if I cut up paper, put it on an iPad, you know, put it on a light pad and just started messing around? That's kind of the, the fun of it. And then release labels and judgment. This is a really good exercise in seeing things for their shape, for their color, for their light, for their line, for their form. Um, it's not trees, it's lines. It's not scraps of paper, it's swirls, you know. Um, and, and releasing judgment that it's, a photograph has to be perfect and, you know, freeze frame, tack sharp, all of these kinds of things. You know, it's stretching your definition of what photography and art can be. I'm going to quick pause, Linda, anything coming up in the chat that's worth uh, that no is question. urgent? No, 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 no questions. It's more of 
uh, people um, sharing some of their own experiences. And now you've, you've challenged a couple of people to try a little bit of <laughs> Faster, faster shutter speed. So, um, oh, good. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of lots of energy, good energy in the chat room tonight. Excellent. Excellent. And just a quick thing about that that shutter speed. When I did the out of Chicago one, um, I remember somebody chatted and said, "One second, I can't move my camera in one second. <laughs> And I thought, well, if you were, if you pay attention to the the metadata that I share, a lot of these are like a fifth of a second, or a tenth, or a thirteenth, and it's very rare. It's one, and you would be surprised how much you can move your camera and how quickly, especially if you're intentional. So, um, and I also like to think, it, you know, ICM stands for imagination, creativity, and magic because it brings all of these things together. And you can get creative. This is a craft. Um, these images that you're seeing, I did um, about a month and a half ago um, with some Christmas lights in a downtown in Indiana. And I used my Lens Baby Spark, which has the accordion focus. And I was like squeezing it and pressing the shutter and moving it and getting these really cool to me patterns. Um, so Imagine it's it's only limited by what your imagination can come up with. So camera, let's talk about some technical sides of things. So some ICM settings that are going to get you off to a right start. And I would say these are sort of baseline guidelines, but stretch it, you know, stretch it in different directions and see what you get. So first, I really advise being in manual mode on your camera. And again, this is assuming like you have just the regular traditional digital camera. Um, that gives you the most flexibility to be able to experiment with different settings without having to um, be limited by anything. Your shutter speed, as I've already alluded to, slow. And that might be anywhere from 1 20th of a second to two seconds long. And experiment and, and notice that the faster the shutter speed, probably the more detail you're going to end up getting in that image. And sometimes that's going to be, that might be important to um, sharing the story that you want to share. So, um, so play around with that and try different settings for different scenes. Aperture, small. So usually F8 plus. And that's because you're having to compensate for the additional light that's coming in from that slow shutter speed. You're going to turn off your um, uh, vibration reduction or any image stabilization that might be present on your lens or your camera body. Because you don't want your camera trying to work to make the image you know, sharper than you want it to be. Um, you can still have it on. It's not like it's going to stop you and play with it. You might find that there's something about it that actually works, but my suggestion is just go ahead and turn that off um, and, and see what happens. Focus manual. Um, even if you have autofocus, what you'll find is that you're trying to autofocus on something and you wanna move the camera and it keeps wanting to like readjust. And so it wears down your battery, it slows you down um, and it can be frustrating. So manually focus, and I do suggest, and this this gets to that, you know, it's not, um, I see them as not blurry or out of focus. I find my best images are where I start in focus and then I move the camera. So you can even see with this calla lily, you know, I've got some sharper edges, relatively speaking, because I started in focus and then did a little movement. If you use a filter, especially for outside um, ICM, daytime ICM, use a um, variable neutral density filter. Again, that helps you to compensate for the slower shutter speed, and it probably will allow you to have a wider aperture if you, if you want it. Um, this is great news for those of you who are like me that are like tripod, blah. <laughs> um, I just, I have not learned to love the tripod yet. So, ICM is an invitation to ditch the tripod. Um, some folks can use it. And, you know, if you have really small controlled motions that you want to make, experiment with it, you know, and if, and if a tripod is something that you're comfortable with, then um, do it. But for me, it's like, woohoo, I, I don't want to have to mess with it. And you'll watch some ICM photographers. There's one on YouTube. I believe his name is Andrew Gray. And if um, anybody knows, you can um, 
chime in. He's over in the UK and you'll watch him in his video out in the field. And he literally will start with his camera like down at hip level and he'll swing it up and he'll just keep doing this. And it's like tripod would never work for that. But some, and you would think, how does he get anything with that? But somehow it comes together in a really compelling image. Make sure you have a full battery <laughs> because you're going to be taking a lot of photos and um, and you're going to be checking your viewfinder quite a bit as you go because Oops. that's sort of how you learn. And then yeah. do I need to pause, Linda? I'm going to ask you to repeat the last thing. Maybe, sure. Maybe it was just on my end, but you we had a little bit of a glitch there. Um, sure. You faded out. So just because I thought... Oh, this is when she's telling us the magical secret. <laughs> full, battery. full battery. Make sure, make sure when you set out that you have a full battery because you're going to be taking a lot of photos. Um, I see them as addictive. So you'll, you're going to get into some flow and you're going to want to keep going. And before you know it, an hour has passed or two hours has passed. And you're going to be checking your viewfinder more frequently, which of course wears down the battery a little bit um, because you want to be sort of checking in, especially when you're starting, like checking in and seeing what are the results from the movements that you're making. So make sure you've got a full battery and make sure you have a large formatted empty memory card in that camera so that um, you're not limited in, you know, there's nothing worse than getting out and then getting in a groove. And then all of a sudden the little message pops up card full. <laughs> um, that's the dreaded thing. And of course have extra ones handy. Um, that's just good practice, but um but just make sure you've got, yeah, have a large memory card out there with you. And then finally, movement. Um, the movement piece is uh, a big part of what makes this special, right? So there's some traditional movements, panning, obviously, like going horizontal. Horizons, obviously, are a, a perfect subject for that. But, um, you know, you can try it with just about anything. This, of course, is this is Lake Michigan. You can see the snow fence there. Um, One thirtieth of a second. Right. So a very quick, short movement um, that's still retained. I love actually that you even still have some detail in the in the shadows. Right. So um, experiment and I could experiment going this way. So do the direction both ways and try it slow. Even if you've got a fast shutter speed, try just like little motion, try fast motion, try um, moving as you're pressing the shutter, try starting the motion before you press the shutter. I find, especially for um, scenes like this, where it's like water or something that I might want to smooth out, I find that starting the motion first and then pressing the shutter as I'm moving results in a smoother um, scene. So again, like those are the kinds of things you, you discover as you experiment. Panning vertically, up and down. Um, here I did downtown Chicago, you know, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I probably went down and up with the motion. Um, this one's 0.4 seconds. Um, experiment, go up to down, go down to up, do slow, do fast, even do jittery as you're doing it. Um, play around with it. I will say um, I often find I can get a smoother result and have a little bit more control for me going down to up. So that might be a good place to start. And if you want to experience some really good results and some satisfying results, start with a horizon and start with trees. Because those are going to the easier motions that you'll be able to get a sense of how, how fast and how slow to move things to get a, a good result. Full body movement. Um, this particular image I took, I was out walking in the winter woods. And I just, I held my camera in front of me. I put it at 1.6 seconds. I put my camera about a foot in front of me and I just let my body motion um, make the movement, my, my footsteps, and I just pressed. <laughs> and I wasn't really watching. I was just like, shoot, 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 shoot. And out of those, I really like this image. And as I'm sharing these, you might not like some of them. That's okay. And I'm going to get to that point a little bit later. To me, I call this one winter's pulse because it feels like there's, it uh, feels like a heartbeat. And I know I was walking when I did it. 
So you can use your whole body. It's not just moving your hand or your wrist, but get your elbow, get your shoulder, get your waist, um, get your legs involved. Um, let yourself really move. You can make waves. Um, this is a slinky over some scrapbook paper. And I just took the camera and it's like, and this is one of the harder ones to do, but it's worth practicing. And when you get it right, you're like, it's like a score. <laughs> um, Zoom. This is another easy one maybe to get started with. This is a sunset 2.5 seconds handheld where I just, I, um, I probably started it out and zoomed in. I'm not sure, but, you know, do out to in, in to out. And you can even, and there was one image I showed earlier where zoom and turn the camera at the same time. <laughs> So you get sort of a double kind of zoom. Um, you can also try hold the camera out and pull it in or push it out, like the whole camera, not just zooming your lens. Rotating or circular. So this one over here, whoops, this one over here, this tree, I, um, I turned it, you know, I just pivoted the camera. This one over here, this is actually the woods at night. <laughs> there was just enough daylight and different colors peeking through. And I just, I moved the camera this way. And when I pulled it into Lightroom, played with the vibrancy, the dehaze, the texture, these colors came out. And I was like, wow, are these colors there all the time? And we just can't see them. Maybe somebody knows if somebody's got a more scientific mind than mine. But, um, but that was done doing this. Let, let and then there's random. Yeah, go ahead, Linda. Let me sneak in with a question because this might. Um, yeah. Be good. Barry's curious. Are you using an ND for all of these? No, I probably am not using one very much for a lot of these because another way to practice, especially if you don't have an ND filter is um, like golden hour or blue hour, you know, go out when you can, when you're not needing to control the light as much. Um. I, I hope that's helpful. So probably most of these, I'm not okay. using that filter. Okay. Let me ask another question since I've interrupted. Uh, Jamie yeah. wondering, um, well, she says that she's tried the Zoom trick, but it just looks like a blurry mess. Any suggestions <laughs> for making this work better for her? First is to make sure um, whatever Zoom lens you're using, a smooth action. I guess that's the best way I can put it that it's because I've had some where the zoom is not particularly smooth and it, it it's not easy to just pivot it, you know? Um, so use a lens where it's a very smooth movement. Um, this might be one where you want to try the tripod because part of it might be that in the process of doing that, there's some camera shake that's happening. That's causing it to do that. So putting it on the tripod and, you know, you might want to hold on to the body and then zoom it might give you some smoother results and just practice that for a while until you kind of get that motion. But I would say just keep, like keep trying, but those are the two things that come to mind that might be um, one that might be contributing to it and two might be a, a solution to, to give you some practice. Um. I'm just going to interrupt again. Um, Dara's curious. Um, I think some you've mentioned that you um, have done composite images. Mm -hmm. Do you do that a lot or are a lot of these composites or? How do you think none of the, yeah, none of these are composites and except that one. Um, and I will share actually the next slide. I'm, I'm going to be sharing a composite. Um, I, I have to admit I'm a light, a Lightroom fluent. Mm -hmm. and um but not native <laughs> not native fluency but fluent um photoshop i would say like mm, i learn different things as i go as i need the skill and so um it's fun to experiment with that but i've not done a lot of that i do like doing in camera multiple exposures um so, so that's, that's something to um, think about, but everything you've seen, unless I have explicitly said is just a single exposure. Perfect. Yeah. Um, except for what I'm about to show. <laughs> so another movement is random. And, and this one's kind of funny because this, you could probably could guess is Christmas lights on the tree. And I'm standing in a dark living room 
and the tree is lit and my husband's in the other room and I'm standing in front of the, the tree shaking my camera like wildly like this. And my husband just walks in and he's like, of course, <laughs> you know, this is what it's like to live with the creative. Um, he's not surprised by anything anymore. So just being random about something, right? So this is the image over here that I ended up, you know, liking as a base for something. Um, this is a tree, you know, sort of that pivot thing. And then I composited them together in Photoshop and created that. And um, this is an image I created during an ICM workshop. Um, and I love it because it can be interpreted in different ways. It has a sort of cosmos kind of feel. Um, a bunch of people said they saw like a whale eye, which I thought was really interesting. Um, so, so you can take your ICMs and use them as a base for other images, combine them, um, combine a still, like take the still and then do an ICM and you'll get some interesting texture and results. And then multiple exposure. So here's an example of one where um, over here on this raw, this is a two exposure shot, uh, obviously of like a, a sunset where I, you know, moved it one, I held it, you know, did a portrait this way. And then I did a um, landscape and that way. And, you know, um, they combined in camera and then I took it over into Lightroom, processed it obviously pulled out some some detail and whatnot, did some cropping, did some orientation and came out with something that I liked. Um, so that's another level and, and layer that you can get into. And then when it comes to subjects, like I've already mentioned, trees are a great place to get practice. That was where I started. I just went for a walk in the woods and, and this might be actually, this is probably among the first like 15 or 20 ICMs that I ever did. Um, and so it's it's uh, it's a way to get some fairly quick, satisfying results. And the same with horizons, sunsets, um, a great way to practice. And then you can start branching out. So this is lettuce. <laughs> um, I took I was chopping up some salad for my husband. I had some hearts of romaine as I was slicing them. I was looking and I'm like, huh, that's really interesting. So I sliced them, arranged them on a cutting board, got out my camera and did this. And of course, you know, I played with the, the palette a little bit there in, um, in Lightroom, but it's like, is it flowers? Are they roses? You know, what is that? But it's lettuce. Here are those uh, strips of construction paper that end up like this. Just through normal Lightroom edits right? Using ICM. This was the scene for making some of these slinky light pad scrapbook paper shots that ended up like this. To me, I love this kind of abstract where you're not quite sure what you're looking at. It's interesting. Um, it's, you know, it, there's just something pleasing about it to me. So, um, so have fun with that, you know, and as soon as you start seeing that, you're like, oh, what about this? What about that? Um, one of the first things I experimented on was um, uh, a pillowcase that had an intricate sort of mandala kind of design, you know, colorful and um, lines and whatnot. And I just played with that to create some texture. Phone. Best camera is the one you have on you, <laughs> right? And we can't always be carrying around our real camera. And so um, take a look for some apps that will give you the capacity to do ICM. Um, I haven't checked recently, but the popular ones um, for iPhone, the app is called Slow Shutter. And then on Android, there's one called Long Exposure Camera 2. And I'm sure if you look in your app stores for either of those, you'll see other related apps and you can find one that works for you. But then you can take it and you can do this anywhere. Obviously, this was on the beach, the beach umbrella. This was out um, the window of an Amtrak train where obviously the train was moving, but I moved the, the phone just a little bit with it. Um, bookcase. This is a suntan lotion um, in the grocery store. <laughs> um, the grocery store is a fun place to experiment with your iPhone, right? Um, obviously this is on the beach. I was probably the same day sitting under that umbrella. It's a great way to practice. Um, and I would say if you're just getting started with ICM, save yourself some frustration and don't try moving objects. <laughs> for a while. Um, like don't try a pet or a baby or people or anything or a bird. Um, 
the I I personally think of those as kind of a little bit more advanced because you've got two movement things going on. So I'd recommend trying like stationary objects and scenes to get started. Um, I don't know that I have time for this. Um, Linda, do I have time? I have. Uh, the answer is yes. Because <laughs> Okay, know, all right. Sure you're going people are probably this, curious. This is all about <laughs> what Linda wants, so yes, please. Okay, all right, let's do it. So I wanted to, I'm not sharing a lot about processing these images, so I thought, let's show, don't tell. And so I thought I would pull up a recent image, and I just shared this one on um, Instagram recently. But this is what a typical ICM raw image will look like. It doesn't look like much. Um, and that will lead me to a tip a little bit later on. But I thought, I'm just going to show you very quickly um, how I approach and where I start editing ICM images. So usually the first thing I do, obviously I've pulled it up in Lightroom, I go to texture clarity and dehaze because I want to quickly be able to tell what kind of um, detail do I have to work with, what kind of lines, what kind of color. So I'm going to go ahead and I just amp it up. You know, I go, I swing it over pretty far. Just like, so see, you can already see like, ooh, okay, that is really different, right? And so, you know, it's probably a little too far in the dehaze, but I'm just going to leave it there for now. I might do this. I often, I'm, amping up the clarity uh, or I'm sorry the texture and then I work up backwards and so I'll go to the blacks and I'll kind of play around a little bit I want some depth so I want to preserve some of that I definitely want to take down some of the whites I want to add lift up the shadows just a little bit take down some of those highlights and then play with contrast and contrast is really interesting because you do this and it brings out more, you do this and you lose, you know, to me, it, it's too much, right? So I'm going to settle about right there and maybe down the exposure just a little bit. So already we're starting to see what, what is here. Then because this is abstract, I can play a little bit with the color. And I find I tend more towards the cool end of the spectrum especially with, uh, oh, I don't really have my hand raised. It thinks I'm, <laughs> um, I tend towards the cool end of the spectrum. And so I'm often finding myself kind of pulling it this way, pulling a little bit to get some of the sort of turquoisey green. And then I will play with the vibrance just a little bit, just until I find like, what's the, the sort of palette? Do I want something natural? Do I want to push it a little bit? Um, do I really want to make it abstract and take it into a totally different direction? So I'll just kind of tweak that and play with that. And then if I need to do anything with these items, you know, I might do a little bit of these kind of universal adjustments. And somebody who's like really into Photoshop and really into color grading and stuff, you might be looking at this and cringing. You have to remember I'm self-taught here. So I'm, <laughs> I'm going with like, I slide things around. I sort of know what's uh, what results I'm going to get, but it's a lot of intuition. I usually am fixing noise. Um, and so I'll get it to about this. And then I'm like, okay, there's, there's too much here. There's dead space. Um, not much interesting. Let's, let's tighten this up what happens. Let's uh, rotate it. Sometimes I might go in and flip horizontal and then I'll sort of mess around and you can see how much it shifts, right? Depending on the orientation. And I kind of like this the best. Um, it feels like there's some flow and my eye is going from the bottom left to the upper upper right. Once I get it into this, then I will revisit and go back and say, okay, you know, do I want to tweak the color, the dark, you know, the blacks, the whites and, and whatnot. So, so I hope you can see, I'll get it to a certain place where I can see, okay, is there potential here? Um, then I'll start messing with the orientation and then I'll go back and say, okay, now that I see this orientation that I'm liking, I'm going to go back and fine tune some things some more. So in a nutshell, starting with that texture clarity dehaze, again, 
you know, go ahead and push things. Um, if I wanted something softer, you know, to me, that's too soft, but somebody might say, oh, yeah, I kind of like that. Or they might want to take away all the texture. So just tinker. experimental. Yeah, tinker. Yeah. Feel free to tinker. So there's a question in the chat. I think it was a video one. It was curious. What was your original object? What, what did you photograph? Um, this, this is an agave plant, like a succulent. Yeah. That's what I thought it was. And I thought, uh -huh. hey. <laughs> yep. You know, and, and that's, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Linda. Hey, just the, I would have never, ever, I don't know who's with me, but I wouldn't have thought to flip it. And that's uh, made a huge difference. And now I don't have a, have no idea what it is, but yep. I think that's what makes it more interesting to me this way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah, you could even go further. You can, you know. <laughs> I love this question, Mika. Um, how do you know when to stop? <laughs> It reminds me, there's a quote, and I can't remember who said it, where they say, "Works of, great works of art are never finished, only abandoned. Um, really? And I think that, <laughs> isn't that great? And, and so it's an intuition and a feeling for me. Um, when I can look at it and there's something that feels settled about it. Um, and, and obviously after I do all this, then I'll go through and sometimes in the moment I'll miss, oh, there's a bright, there's a hot spot over here. or um, I haven't cropped it quite enough. And so there's this funky little thing up here in the corner and I might want to tweak that. Um, but at some point, yeah, you just kind of have to say, yeah, okay, this, <laughs> it sounds really simple, but like this pleases me, you know, there's something about this that makes me happy. Um, and I'm going to let it be. Now I've heard of other photographers and this is especially true depending on where you are in your, your journey, especially your technical journey they will um, let it be, you know, and they might be sharing it and whatnot, but then they'll make a point to like revisit favorite images a few years, even a few years later. And they'll reprocess it and try to see it again in a new way. And they have new skills. Like I know I'm editing differently than even I probably was six months ago. And so as your skills develop, you'll start seeing things a little bit differently. So I think it's, for me anyway, it's mostly like that intuitive, like, yeah, that feels, that feels good. Um, yeah. So I know it's a squishy answer, but, uh, <laughs> that's, that's what I know. Um, so let's see quickly back to here. So, um, so 10 tips to get you started or keep you going that I'm going to finish with. Here's an example. This is, um, do you know what this is? Anybody? It's, oh, it's, oh, it's a flower. Okay. Mm, I think it's a flower. It's grass. Is it so grass? It's grass. What right? kind of grass so. do you have in Michigan? That's <laughs> crazy, <laughs> crazy grass, right? I was thinking it was, one, is... of those, was one of those shaggy <laughs> uh, sunflowers, you know, like the tip. Yeah. All uh -huh. right, grass. Well, I was visiting a, a like pick your own flower garden, right? And uh, and I noticed the the spiky grass. I don't know what it's called, but it was a clear sky, and I was down, and I'm like, oh, this is kind of cool. So I started just like flicking the camera up and getting the blades of grass as these you know literal blades, right? And I actually just yesterday, I think, took it into Lightroom and said, what happens if I turn it red, orange? You know, I put it on a warm palette. So it looks maybe a little bit more like fire or petals or something. That's what's kind of fun and cool, right? That you can play with things like that and play with people's um, perception. And that reminds me of the other thing. Oftentimes when you're doing ICM, especially when it's more abstract, people are going to want to know, what, what did you take a picture of? You know? And, and I've come to think of it as um, the, the subject is like, in this case, the subject is to me, the color and the lines, the object is the grass um, with the, uh, the paper spirals, you know, the subject wasn't the spirals. The subject was the shapes that, that it made, the, the smoothness, the lines or the direction or the energy of it. 
the object that was photographed were the spirals. So that's just how I've come to try to think about the difference between those things. And and instead of like being quick to answer, not to be coy, but we could say, what do you think it is? <laughs> you know, or what do you see? Um, and and that gets all into that philosophical stuff about, you know, do you who interprets the piece and what it is and how much do you want to say about it versus just letting people experience it on their own? So 10 tips to close us out. And some of these I've already started to allude to. So number one, monitor your viewfinder to learn the movement and result. So kind of check it as you go. Um, here's an example. I was in a greenhouse. There were these um, triangle ficus in plants on the floor, like clustered and sort of tight. And I looked at it and I thought, huh, that, that would make kind of a cool mottled abstract. So my first motions here on frame 214 were just sort of like, just shake it a little bit, right? So this is a processed image. A few frames later, I'm starting to like maybe move it a little bit more smoothly and getting a slightly different result. About 25, 30 frames later, I'm realizing, oh, okay, what happens if I do this? And I started sort of moving the camera like a S, you know, like a snake. And I started being able to see in my viewfinder, oh, I'm getting these kind of cool curves. And then, a few, let's see, that's just a few frames later. I'm getting a little better as I'm monitoring this. Then finally, I get this. To me, this is like, this was like making me super happy. I processed this and I was like, cool. And you can see the back of the frame, like you can tell that there's something there. But then when I pull in the Lightroom, texture, dehaze, vibrance, duh, 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 boom, there it is. And I just think it's super cool. And you can see this is 140-ish frames from that very first one that I shared you. So that was the evolution. And that's how long it took for me to figure out what kind of motion would result in something that I was excited about. Tip number two, this is just like with traditional photography, look for interesting light, lines, contrast, and color. You're still looking for those things. And the more you have those kind of variables, the more kind of options you'll have. Um, this is the um, Flamingo um, public sculpture in uh, downtown Chicago. And I took a still of it and it's, it's kind of cool, but I love the ICM because it gives us this motion to this static object. It feels more alive. Um, so be looking for light contrast lines and color. Do not, do not, do not, do not delete in camera. <laughs> um, you already saw with those ficus plants, like if you were to look at those, like, eh, that's, that's crud, you know, and delete, delete, delete. This, yuck, right? <laughs> um, but then I process it and I get that. These are piano, this is a piano keyboard. Um, abstract image, some people might like it, some people might not. I find it pleasing, the geometry of it, the balance of it, the gradations and whatnot. But if I had deleted in camera, I would have missed it. So resist the urge to delete in camera, pull in the Lightroom and see what you got. Yeah, Linda. Yeah, let me, let me, okay. There's a question that she, she came in after you went past the slide and I'm thinking I wanna go ahead and get you to answer it so you don't have to go that many slides back. But Judy's yeah. wanting to know, Keith, and you had, um, I think it was number 357. What motion did you use for 357? Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry to make you go back. There you go. But this was, one? Yeah. This was a like, like this, like a, an S, side to side. And you can experiment just like with the um, circular. Mm -hmm. Like circular, you can move the whole camera in a circle or you can pivot so that it's like more the lens that's moving in the circle, if that makes sense. And so with these, you can, um, what's the best way I can do this? I meant to actually have my camera body and I forgot to grab it, but um, I could do this, like this, or, um, oh, let, let me think about this for a second. I think that that's what I did, or, something like that. So it's just making it in that S shape. 
I had it in my head a second ago and it left me. Um, I hope that makes sense. And, and here's the other thing that is frustrating as heck. When you are, especially when you're learning and you're experimenting and you're in a flow, you start mixing up your movements. <laughs> and so I might go, woo, and then I'll go, woo, and then I'll go, woo. And I'm checking and sometimes I'm moving too fast and I can't, and I'll see something. I'm like, oh, that was cool. What the heck did I do to make that happen? Um, and I can't re replicate it. Or it takes me a little while to get back there. Um, so I've even thought about like practicing and saying, okay, for the next 10 frames, I'm just going to make this motion and keep refining it so that I know this is the motion I made to get this effect. Um, and then I'll switch and here's the motion I'm going to make. So kind of keeping a log. I've, I haven't done that yet. Um, Cause it's, it, 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 to me, it would sort of like take me yeah. out of the moment. And it, and I think that there's a certain, there, there's a certain, um, has anyone had one of those uh, I think it's a Zen Buddhist kind of thing. You can get them at Barnes and Noble <laughs> where it's a, a, a blank board and you dip a pen in water, like a brush in water, and then you brush on it and it stays on there and then it disappears. So there's something about impermanence. It's just like when the Tibetan monks make the mandala out of sand and they will spend like days or weeks on this and it's intricate and it's gorgeous. And then they, yeah. and they blow it away. Right. So when it says that's called a Buddha board, a Buddha, bo that's what it is. A Buddha board. There's something about ICM that is like about the art of letting go of control <laughs> and letting go of having to know and trusting and, and saying, I got it once. And if I like, I got this image once and if I love it, Part of it is sort of a, a psychological and emotional embracing of like, if that's the only one I get like that, I'm good because I know I'm going to create something else that's also going to be cool. And then another thing that'll be cool. I don't need to replicate this. But let me ask you this. Let me slip this in. Um, do you mm -hmm. shoot, uh, I believe it was Ariel that wanted to know, do you shoot in black and white? Um, do I shoot, shoot in black and white? Yeah, you know, I see them in black and white. It it's kind of a rare image that works in black and white. Like that piano keyboard kind of worked because the piano keyboard's already black and white. Uh, but I actually did process it and use different tones, like blue and you know whatnot. But um, uh, most I see them you'll see is in color. Okay. And, I and guess maybe because too some of your first and you know this is what you started with. This is what you're in. Uh huh. They kind of look a little, look. yeah. So it was even I yep. was wondering maybe it was black and white, and then you were, yeah, converting. Yeah, converting. no, the it the camera is set on color. Okay, so so that image is in color, and it's just bringing it out in post. I think it gets washed out because you've got such a slow shutter speed, even though you have the the faster or the um, smaller aperture. Um, but not all are like this. I, and I hadn't thought about that because I do have some that are practically out of camera. They just need a little bit of tweaking, but you can see the color like there it's there. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thanks for that long interruption. Sorry. All right. Let's yeah, go. That's, that's okay. Okay. So I'm going to try because I know we're, we're, um, Fine. around our, the time. Okay. So number four, embrace a low success rate. If you haven't already heard me say it a few times, you're going to take a lot of photos before you get a few that you're like, yes, I, I like that. That works. And so like these two photos are um, Aqua Tower in downtown Chicago. Very cool structure. So perfect for ICM if you ever get a chance to um, visit. I took about 175 photos just to get three or four worth sharing. <laughs> but what happens is it's kind of like baseball. You can watch it for like an hour and nothing happens. And then a home run or somebody hits the ball and it's like super exciting. I see like processing my ICM images that same way where it's like, nope, 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 nope. Yes. And the yes feels bigger. <laughs> it feels more exciting um, to me. So just embrace the fact that you're going to take, you know, a hundred shots 
to maybe get a couple that you really feel like are worth like, yeah, this, these feel good. That's just part of it. Five, create virtual copies. So again, assuming Lightroom, um, I heard one instructor at Out of Chicago say he, they made like 10 virtual copies of every image and then they would just play with each one. I usually make three or four um, and then play with the crop, the color, the contrast. Um, this is the raw image. I took a red ribbon, put it on the, iPad, the um, light pad and then just was like swiping, right? And so that's raw, that's unprocessed. There you can see the red you know, because that's a vivid enough, then taking it, processing it, processing it again, you know, so different virtual copies with different results. And this one, you can see I flipped it and did different things. So um, take time to, to experiment with it. Ah, number six, keep your sensor clean. <laughs> because you're operating at um, smaller apertures, the smaller the aperture, the more your dust spots and whatnot are going to show up. You can probably see some here on this um, where I've got my cursor. I'll show you even more vividly. How horrible. This is like Beth's wall of shame <laughs> because look at those spots. And there's there are a few things that are more disappointing than like going out in the field, get, coming back and seeing like, wow, that's a cool shot. And then you're really looking at it and you're and it's so um, mucky that you're like, is it really worth processing and getting rid of the thousand spots that are there? Um, and I was, this is, a, you know, I hope none of you have a sensor like this. And I actually ended up replacing my sensor because there was some damage to it. So it had to be shipped off and, and brought back. And it's so much better now, but um, huge lesson learned. And, um, you know, so get your, the, the blow rocket thing, you know, do take care when you're changing your lenses and think twice before you're changing your lens. Like, do you really have to, especially if you're out in wind and all that kind of thing, but um, nothing will bring out the spots more than I see them. Be okay with looking goofy. <laughs> so you're going to be out, you're going to be swinging it around. You might be walking and holding your camera in front of you. Um, somebody might come up to you and say, you know, the point is to keep it still, um, just be okay. You know, just be okay with embracing it and doing what you need to do because you're going to get some cool results. If you do, um, this is Marina towers in, uh, Chicago. Okay. They call it the corn cobs, I think. Oh, yeah. That yeah. Is very, very cool. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you actually make it look more interesting than it really is. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of my favorite ICM subjects. It's it's one of those where you'll you'll literally like stand and you might take like 500 photos of just trying different things, right? So um it like I said, it's addictive. Number eight, be okay with mixed messages to your images. We already have to have something of a thick skin if we're putting our work out there, right? Um, this image that I'm sharing here, this was actually shot on my iPhone using the slow shutter app. Um, I love this picture and it's it's a normal photo. You know, I mean, it's pretty. I love the light. I love the smoothness of it. I love the clouds and, and whatnot. I love the way the sun is a little bit diffused um, because of the ICM. But there's nothing really spectacular, but it's the kind of photo you can post on Facebook and people are like, oh, that's so beautiful and I love it and whatnot, right? Um, but then I posted this and I really like it. I think it looks like a watercolor kind of thing. But this was one of the comments I got pretty, but it makes me rub my eyes, <laughs> you know, and that's a more, that's a kinder response than, you know, some other people might have. Um, so some photographers don't like ICM, lots of people who don't know what it is. And then what I think is so interesting is like, if I had told you this was a watercolor, would somebody say, Oh, I had to sort of do this. I think because we are saying this is a photo, our brains are going photograph, literal object, in focus, definable. And that does, this does not compute, right? Um, so be, be ready for, for that kind of reaction. 
and for not everybody to like it. And the more you develop your own style, the more you practice it, and the more confident you get with it, the less you're going to care. <laughs> and you'll you'll know what what works for you. Um, join community. You already know the value of this through Linda and the happiness hour and the value of being um, with others. But I highly recommend there are several ICM groups on Facebook. But if you're on Facebook and you want to join a group, um, join the ICM photo mag group because I think it's the most rigorous of the groups in terms of um, learning. Um, you know, they're only posting ICM. There's nothing else that sneaks in there because all the posts are moderated. Um, people share how often they'll share how they got their image. Um, there's a series of hashtags that, you know, like hashtag two, single exposure, normal processing, you know, or hashtag eight, mobile phone, creative processing, you know. So you get a sense of um, a little bit of the backstory of that image. And, and oftentimes people will say something about it. So I find it to be a very supportive group and a great place to learn and a great place to see a, a wide range of um, ICM, both from absolute newbies to people who make their living doing ICM. So you get this full spectrum that's really wonderful. And through that group, this is where I discovered um, the ICM magazine and the ICM photo mag network. And I participated in a workshop um, in a, a year ago. And um, the value of that workshop, besides getting better and more comfortable with ICM and, and um, understanding it more, was it was the first time I learned how to put together a series because that was part of the goal of the workshop is to create a project. And I use the prompt of this Rilke quote, I live my life in widening circles that reach out across the world. I may not complete this last one, but I give myself to it. And so, um, so I went out and, and these are all actually, to go back to that composite question, these are all composites and they're all two ICMs combined. Um, so I, I recommend this kind of workshop experience um, to start to, you know, get comfortable with the, the techniques, to get feedback, to, to just practice and, and gain confidence. And then finally, um, tip 10, follow ICM related photographers and hashtags on Instagram. I've only listed a few here, but each of these is a portal <laughs> to all sorts of ICM photographers. So I'm not, there are some fabulous ones on ICM, on um, Instagram in particular, but, um, you know, maybe start with ICM photo mag, follow them, click on who are they following, take a look at their portfolios and, uh, and then follow as, as something appeals to you. Um, Kaisa Saren, um, or Saren, um, Morag Patterson, and Stephanie Johnson, they are collectively the founders of the ICM Photo Mag. So they are a portal. And then Christopher Weeks is somehow related. I know he's a, mod a moderator on the Facebook group. So, um, and he does really beautiful work. Um, so follow these folks and then look at who they're following and go down the ICM rabbit hole. But the most important thing is to play, play, play. <laughs> that goes back to uh, someone's comment before they said, I feel like a child. And it's taken me a little while and I'm still working on embracing the word play when it comes to my photography. Um, because I feel like, oh, if I want to be taken seriously, I say I'm experimenting or I'm trying out. Like, you know, if it's not play, if it's not fun, if it doesn't, you know, energize and feed us, then why why do it you know so i'm trying to embrace play and i um invite you to to join me in that so ultimately just experiment enjoy the process and uh and be in community so that's that that's wonderful all right um, <laughs> thank you for taking down your screen okay i have a couple of questions before i let you go yeah i don't want to let you go um so <laughs> The first um, question is from Sue. Um, she caught a lot of the f-stops and the shutter speeds, but she didn't catch, um, and I don't remember you mentioning if you had a favorite lens. I know that you used a lot of different Oh, lenses. yeah. It's a good lens for people to get started with. I love using um, 
if you if you like lens babies and you have them, I used a lot with my lens baby Velvet Fifty Six because um, it has wonderful both distance and macro capabilities. And when it's at that higher aperture um, or smaller apertures, uh, it gives you some detail, right? You you lose the glow, and it it's like a normal lens, and it's a sharp, beautiful lens. Um, when I'm outside for landscape kind of stuff, a 70 to 200 is, is a really good one. I, I do like using zooms because then you've got more flexibility, right? Go in, go out, you can do the zoom motion. Um, so I would say, yeah, the, the velvet and the 70 to 200. And then sometimes, um, especially with architecture, I'll use a 100 to 400. Okay. That's a good variety of, of, uh, options to try. Um, yeah. Ariel, and if this, she's going to ask if you do it, and if you don't do it, I think we all should kind of consider doing it. She wanted to know if you set up an ICM custom dial on your camera. I have not. Doesn't that sound like a I great idea? It does. <laughs> and, you know, yeah, if you've got different customization options, um, and as particularly if you return to particular scenes a lot, like I find myself down at Lake Michigan at sunset. So it might make sense to, to set something. And, you know, I kind of, um, I'm a, I love technology, but that might be one area where I'm a sort of a Luddite where I'm like, I just want to, I, I don't want anything that's going to lock me in sure. for anything. So I just want total freedom to, change on the fly without thinking about, oh, I've got to get out of this and get into that. Okay. So me it, it, individual preferences, right? So, yeah. All right. Uh, Jeannie's curious, um, when you do your composites or how do you, how do you, do, how do you do your composites? What, what type of layering are you doing? Um, usually it's in Photoshop, you know, creating the, you pull in those, those layers and I'm usually using overlay, I think. Um, or sometimes screen, I play around, <laughs> you know, um, I wish I could tell you, like, I know I'm going to get this result when I do this, but I will just flip through them and I see what effect I get. And because it's going to be different, you know, with different ones and I'll invert, I will change one to black and white and a color, you know, so play with it. But often like the basic ones of like overlay or screen, um, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones that I might often go to, but those are often the ones that get good results. Um, this question kind of snuck in way past the, um, it was a sunset photo. And I'm sorry, I don't know if that's your name or your, it, Maris, I don't, I'm not sure who it is, but anyway, she, he, she is curious, love the sunset, but miss the settings. Do you, do you remember mm -hmm. your ISO or F-stop or anything like that you could share? Let's see, the sunset. Which, uh, uh, I think it was maybe the last one of the waves. That's what I'm going to go with. Ah, so that was the iPhone one. And that was with the slow shutter app. It was a one second. And the thing with the apps, at least on the iPhone, it doesn't, you don't have like an ice, it, it doesn't give you those options. It basically what you control is this, the, um, the shutter speed and how much blur you want. And so that one was one second open with medium blur. And what's kind of interesting to do as well, the longer, like a one second sounds quick, but you actually have time. I think for that one, I moved it a little bit and then I stayed still. And that's one way you get a little bit of motion, but you still get some definition. So again, like another thing to play with, like if you leave it open for two seconds, Keep it still and then move it or move it and then keep it still, you know. Okay. So. Um, and I also think there's another oh, zoom sunset. Okay. Maybe I see what she's saying. Sunset. Yeah. And I'm yep. sorry. I misread that question. I'm not sure. That's but. okay. Um, I can tell you real fast. Oh, yes, I can. So that was 270 millimeters, 2.5 seconds, F36, ISO 100. Perfect. Um, Jamie snuck one in here. Is it hard to keep horizons straight with ICM? 
I don't find if you're just doing a poop, I find it's not hard. I'm I'm consistently shocked at how I don't have to adjust the horizon. Okay. So, so practice it. Practice is the key here. One last question. Um, and I've lost my screen real quick. What did I just do here? Hmm. Okay. This came from Rhonda. And mm -hmm. she's kind of new to this. She thinks it's pretty cool. Um, but she's curious, what do you do with these types of pictures? Yeah, <laughs> I've sold some. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like the one behind me, I've sold this. Um, and so it it works to, you know, it, and, and generally the ones that are going to sell are maybe those more recognizable kinds of ones. Um, the other possibility that actually Ariel uh, shared with me is if you're into wanting to sell some of your work, I see them like that one with the ficus plants that was all wavy. That would make a beautiful silk scarf. Um, <laughs> so it's not the same as hanging on a museum wall, but it's something that is like your art manifesting itself in something beautiful that somebody can enjoy. Right. So I, yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, Pat, uh, uh, one in, I'm going to do it. Um, and I lost the question. Let me get there real quick. What paper? What kind of papers are best for printing? Um, it depends on color or black and white or how you're displaying it. Um, and I tend to go with matte paper, you know, something that's like a fine art, mm -hmm. um, rag, you know, to a little bit of texture, like, which I think um, gives it more of a painterly kind of quality, you know, something that gives it a little bit of depth. So I am not the person to ask. So if somebody else has a, a more intelligent <laughs> response, please share in the chat. <laughs> I think that's when you start experimenting and, and see, yep. you know, run a couple of test prints. All right, mm -hmm. Beth. Oh my goodness. I, I just, I am thrilled that you said yes. Cause I always Thank get, you. I always wonder, are they going to say yes? And how am I going to break them and make them say, make, make them say, <laughs> break them. Yeah. <laughs> I will break you. But I didn't have to work really hard on you. And I, I knew yeah. this was going to be good. And I, um, I have to tell you something that's kind of funny to me. Um, Anybody that mentions a bird, we get this room is full when we get birders. <laughs> you, so I'm like, you, don't try a bird. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just sitting there going, all right, birders. I we see your bird. <laughs> I see him kicked some tail tonight. So you had a great, great um amount of people in here. And I think that you stoked a lot of interest. Um Good. I I I'm giggling because a couple of people in this room have uh, borrowed cameras from me and um one of them has a velvet 56 in the package she has so i'm hoping that they will you know stop running out of excuses and uh charge those batteries and and get off their couch and do something fun with um this because you can do this in your living room that's part of what i wanted to say like the lettuce the <laughs> the slinky <laughs> Yeah. I there's there's a guy on in the Facebook group that will take um it's like objects on his desk. Yeah. And and you would never guess it and it's really oh, cool. Yeah. So just yeah. your closet, your bookcase. <laughs> just do it. Well, somebody wrote <laughs> dog bowl and uh, I'll just make fun of her cuz she's she she opened it up. She's wondering who I'm talking about. I'm talking about you Elaine Pruden with my camera and my Velvet 56. Oh, yeah. She says, I wonder yeah. who you're talking yeah. about. <laughs> yeah. I'll just call them out. I'm not afraid. All right, Beth, thank you so much for doing this. And you're welcome. They, I love it. So I hope everybody else, awesome. did, I think everybody else did too, because this was something very different for a lot of people. And I know that some people are starting to try it and like mm -hmm. me, I'll try it and I have fun with it, but I don't consistently get the shot. And one of the things that you did, and I, I thought that was the most effective thing that you could show when you're teaching somebody, this is like, you know, shot five. And now this is shot 147. I'm like, that's what I'm missing. I quit <laughs> round 20 thinking I just can't yeah. get that to move on. So, um, it it's, 
it's practice, practice, practice. And we all just like everything, yeah. like everything, dang it. But yeah. I want to say <laughs> Guys, you can connect with Beth through, I think the easiest is probably start with Beth Below, and I will link all of that in the show notes yeah. if you're watching this on YouTube, um, but on Instagram, your Beth Below photo, is that right? Yes. Um, I so appreciate you coming. I'm tickled, tickled, tickled. All right. Next week, South Texas wildlife photographer Ruth Hoyt returns to the happiness hour. She's going to present know your subject intimately. And I told her, I said, no, 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 we can't say that. We have to say know your wildlife subject intimately. And she's like, no, 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 no. Let's just leave it that way. So, but Ruth's going to talk about how you can better how you can become a better wildlife photographer just by learning a little bit more about your subject um, before you even pick up your camera and head out. So until next time, go out and create something beautiful. And I hope that we see you again soon.